Welcome to Jews in the South, a series of programs exploring the history and culture of Jewish life in the South through field trips and lectures with Georgia State University's Jewish Studies program. This is part one of a presentation by historian Sandy Berman on the notorious Leo Frank case that gripped Atlanta and beyond in the early part of the 20th century. Just by way of introduction, I retired about six months ago. I was at the Bremen for almost 30 years. I started the archives back in 1985. And um, when I first came to Atlanta all those years ago, and we started this, this archive to collect the history of Jewish life in the, in, in the Atlanta area, and eventually we moved to Georgia and into Alabama, one of the main things I knew that um, had to be an integral part of the collecting process was to find and collect material on the Leo Frank case, because it was the, one of the most important um, events in Southern Jewish history, and really national Jewish history, American Jewish history. It's compared to with the Dreyfus case um, in France, the Bayless case in Russia, if you're not familiar with that, it's, it's sort of similar, and it might be worth looking it up on Wikipedia. Um, or, uh, but it, it's, it's, it changed the way the Jewish community in Atlanta thought about themselves. It was really a seminal event. And so for my entire tenure at the Bremen, I collected material relating to the case. And believe me, it wasn't that easy because um, Leo Frank was arrested in 1913. Um, and his family, he was not from here. Um, he was from New York, um, actually born in Cuero, Texas, but moved to New York as, as a baby. and. His family was up there. The only part of his family that was here in Atlanta were, his, were members of his wife's family, and they really didn't want to talk about it too much. So um, it, it was a long struggle, and I'll tell you a little bit more about collecting some of these things as we move on, um, of, of finding material. And eventually, it all led to an exhibition that we, um, the Bremen, put up about, um, gosh, now about five years ago. And it's going to be. I just heard recently that the exhibition is going to be reinstalled for in 2015 for the 100th year anniversary commemorating the lynching of Leo Frank. So you might all want to um, see it when it's up at that point in time. So to get to the exhibition and to the case, um, you all read Dinnerstein's book, I think. So you're all familiar with the kind of the events of, of what happened. A uh, little girl by the name of Mary Fagan, she's murdered, found murdered at the basement of the National Pencil Company. The night watchman neatly discovers the body and is um, and calls the police. Um, to really understand the Frank case, however, you have to put it into the context of the times. And when we decided to do this exhibition, we knew immediately that to put it in the context of the times, we had to discuss lynching in general. Why is this one case, why does this one case um, of a Jewish white man created such press when literally by the 1930s there were over 3,000 lynchings in the United States? So, and all of, mostly of African Americans, and mostly in the South. So um, we just started to, um, so I'm going to tell you um, that we used this quote at the very beginning of the exhibition. It actually was, is a poem that was written by Abel Mirapol in 1937. He was a, a Jewish writer in New York. Um, and the quote was later turned into a song and made very popular by Billie Holiday. And it's called Strange Fruit. But the quote said, southern trees bear strange fruit, blood on the leaves and blood on the root, black bodies swinging in the southern breeze, strange fruit hanging from the poplar trees. Of course, that is black bodies hanging from the trees. Um, and yet Leo Frank 
one white man's case is still studied, talked about, made into TV movies. There have been books written. There, there have been a PBS movie. There is a PBS special in Canada. There's been countless, countless books, a Broadway play and a Broadway musical. So the case continues to resonate as something to be studied. And the main reason is, is that the lynchings of African Americans across the South was mainly a spontaneous event. It was crowds getting angry, uh, mobs, because of a um, um, something that they thought um, a, a, an African American might have done. The Frank lynching was different. It was a state-sponsored conspiracy. Um, the State Prison and Paroles Board of, the, of Georgia conspired with the lynching um, conspirators and carried out something without a shot being fired and actually kidnapped a man from the state prison in Milledgeville, Georgia. So, and that is something that Dinnerstein, in his book, didn't address at all. Um, he did it as a dissertation, he did it many years ago, and there's been a lot more research and um, documents uncovered since Dinnerstein wrote his book all those years ago. Okay, so now if we talk a little bit about the case, and again, the context. You can't really understand what happened to Leo Frank if you don't understand what was happening in the Deep South around the turn of the century. In 1895, there was a, um, an exposition. It was the Cotton States and International Exposition. It was held at Piedmont Park. How many of you all been to Piedmont Park? Okay, one of the buildings is still standing, um, the little boathouse. That's the only thing that's standing from the exposition. It was a unbelievable state fair. And the reason that Atlanta held it was because they wanted to highlight all of the great things that was happening in the New South. That there were um, harmonious race relations, the buildings that were erected at Piedmont Park and then just torn down afterwards. But um, they really wanted to highlight that there were harmonious race relations in the Deep South, so there was a Negro building. They wanted to show that women were really moving forward and that they enjoyed working in factories, so there was a women's building. That living conditions for all people in the South were, were just fantastic, and unlike in the industrial North, immigration was not a problem. So those are the issues that the exposition wanted to highlight. And as you can see, it was very, very, um, it, was, it was nationally known. Even John Philip Sousa, who was the March King, came down and wrote a march specifically for the exposition. Um, but that was not really what the reality of the New South was. There were not harmonious race relations. Living conditions for a lot of people were, were horrible. Working conditions, there were no, um, laws to protect women and children in the factories, and immigration was becoming a problem. No, it wasn't like the industrial north, but by the turn of the century, groups of immigrants were coming over from Eastern Europe and settling in the south, and a large number of them were Jews. So here we have in 1906, a newspaper headline um, uh, discussing the uh, the race riot of 1906, there was a massive race riot in Atlanta with, with a numbers of, of black individuals lynched again, um, and it was really trumped up charges of African Americans accosting uh, white women. So uh, it was like the same old story over and over again. Um, again, female workers at Fulton Bag and Cotton Mills, no laws to protect the hours they worked. Um, there was a strike in 1913 and then another strike in 1914. And what you should probably know is that, the net, that these workers at Fulton Bag and Cotton Mill, like the workers at the National Pencil Company, both factories were owned by prominent Jewish families in Atlanta. Fulton Bag and Cotton Mill at, in 1915 was the largest employer in Atlanta. And the mill is still standing. I don't know if any of you drive by the mill. It's, it's one of the only landmarks left of old Atlanta. So if you go on a tour of old Atlanta, you need to go by the mill because that's one of the only things that wasn't torn down. Um, these are photographs from a housing study of an African-American neighborhood just north of Mechanicsville and a bit south of Beaver Slide. And you can see how um, 
really horrible the living conditions were. No indoor plumbing at all. And this is a relief card from the newly founded um, Atlanta Federation for Jewish Social Service. Um, these immigrants were coming, these new immigrants from Eastern Europe. A lot of them were really in dire straits. So it wasn't, um, the New South was experiencing for the first time a, a rush of people that, that didn't quite fit in. And some of these newly arriving immigrants from Eastern Europe, they dressed differently, they acted differently, they didn't speak English, they cooked differently. And that's one of the reasons why the Atlanta Federation for Jewish Social Service was founded, to help them learn how to become American so they wouldn't stand out as much. So now we get to the actual case. You know that, you know, so this is the context where this little girl is murdered. We have these two um, different views. We have the, the dream or the vision of the New South, but then we have the reality of the New South. And Mary Fagan was um, just shy of her 14th birthday when she went on April 26 to collect her pay, it was Confederate Memorial Day, and she, her job at the National Pencil Company was to put uh, metal tabs on the tops of pencils and with, so the erasers could stick in. And they were, had run out of the, the metal. So she decides to go get her pay while enjoying the parade and asks Leo Frank, the superintendent of the factory, if the metal had come in. Um, this is Leo Frank. This is him at Grand Park in 1909. He was courting Lucille Selig. Um, they weren't married yet. Lucille Selig is, um, was part of a very prominent old German Jewish um, uh, family from Atlanta. I'm sure you see signs all around the city saying Selig Industries, Selig Property, Selig this. That's her. She was part of that family. And he was born in Cuero, Texas, as I said, but his uncle, Moses Frank, lived in Atlanta and was himself a Confederate veteran and was part owner of the National Pencil F Factory or company. Um, and so when Leo graduated from Cornell, he was sent by his uncle Moses to Germany to learn the pencil business. He sent him to Eberhard Faber, which is the biggest, most well-known pencil company to learn how to make pencils. And then he brings him down to Atlanta to run the factory. So he becomes superintendent of the National Pencil Company, and he marry, meets and marries uh, Lucille Selig. And they become a part of Atlanta Jewish kind of society, German Jewish society. They're members of the temple, which is on Peachtree Street. Um, they, he becomes very active in the B'nai B'rith, and she does as, and she becomes active in National Council of Jewish Women, which was kind of the um, the women's organization for German Jewish women, and they're living sort of the good life until that horrible moment when the police come knocking on his door to tell him that a little girl had been murdered at the pencil factory and the body was found um, by the night watchman. This is a, a very rare photograph of the Fagan family at the funeral. Um, Mary Fagan's niece, great niece, Mary Fagan Keene, actually gave us this photograph uh, for the exhibition and allowed us to make copies for the archives. So it's really unusual to have something like this and something that, actually, that came from the Fagan family. So they question a number of different people. They question two people that um, were seen to maybe have had an talking to Mary Fagan, and they immediately let them go, and they know that they, they haven't done anything. They question Newtley, the night watchman. And the reason they really question him is because these notes, which we call the murder notes, um, the originals are long gone. No one knows where they are. But luckily, um, they were reproduced in the Atlanta Journal at the time, so, they could, so the public could compare handwriting. Um, and there were a number of different suspects that were now coming into play. They still thought perhaps it was Newt Lee because one of the murder notes said, um, a long, tall, black Negro did buy him himself. Newt Lee was very tall and very lean. So it looks like the murder notes, or whoever wrote them, is, is pointing the direction at Newt Lee. Well, days after they have already arrested Leo Frank, 
someone sees another individual washing out a bloody shirt. His name's Jim Conley, and he's the sweeper at the pencil factory. And he's kind of a robust individual, definitely not long, tall. Um, and they pick him up as well, and they have him write out part of the murder notes. And then they have um, Leo Frank. So we have three um, handwriting. We have Frank, we have Conley, and we have Lee, and then this is the actual part of the note. And as you can tell, it was Conley's handwriting that was identical to that of the writing on the murder notes. Jews in the South will be right back. So Conley is brought in for questioning, and he, he needs to explain what, how come his handwriting matches that which is found by the body. And what he tells is a story that he that retells over and over again. He changes it three, sep three times under three separate depositions. But he says that he didn't he, he did pen the murder notes, but they were dictated to him by Leo Frank, and that he was Leo Frank's accomplice only in helping him get rid of the body, that Leo Frank often met with young women on Saturday afternoons at the pencil factory where he would want to have, um, where he would have a, uh, a tryst, you know, meet with up with them, want to take them into a dark room, whatever. And on this particular Saturday, and, and, that new, and that Jim Conley was his lookout, and that if he noticed anyone coming or heard any odd noises, he would um, stomp on the floor a few times and let Leo Frank know that someone was coming and he had to stop whatever he was doing. But, so Jim Conley tells the police that on this particular Saturday, something goes terribly wrong and the little girl is murdered. She hits her head, she dies, and that Leo Frank orders him to get rid of the body. And this is where a very important aspect of the case comes into play, which we'll talk about again later, and it becomes a very important part of the trial. Jim Conley always says that Leo Frank asked him to throw the body down the elevator shaft or um, the coal chute, and it goes into the basement, and that's where she's found. The defense will claim always that Jim Conley used the elevator to take the body down to the basement. And I know that sounds like it's not very important now, but it will be later, and we'll, we'll get to that in just a few minutes. So they, the grand jury meets, and they indict after just uh, a few minutes, actually, they indict Leo Frank for the murder of Mary Fagan, and they hold Jim Con um, Newtley over as a key witness. I um, mean, you can see this is the headline. Frank and Lee ordered held by coroner's jury for Mary Fagan's murder. And I have to tell you, this was the O.J. Simpson trial of its day. It was the Lindbergh case. It was any sensational trial that you, that you have heard about later. That's what this trial was. There were three Atlanta newspapers at the time. There was the Georgian, the Journal, and the Constitution. And it was in the paper every day, all day, extras, morning, noon, and night. The case was publicized. So um, when we decided to do the exhibition, we were actually able to find originals of these newspapers. And as you walked through the exhibition, you could really read the headlines the same way somebody in real time could have read the headlines back in 1913. Um, so you can see in this headline, um, it says, Dorsey replies to the charges of Mrs. Leo Frank, say, um, saying that, uh, Mrs. Leo Franks charged um, the prosecutor with being prejudicial. That's the only known photograph of Jim Conley. And as I said earlier, we um, were very fortunate, or we did a lot of research over the years to find new material on the Frank case. And this um, was something we found up in New York in um, the New York Times archives. And I'll tell you a little bit in a, in a few minutes, I'll tell you why the New York Times archives had a photograph of Jim Conley, but it is the only known photograph of, of Jim Conley. The trial began in July at the City Hall in 1913. Um, it was extremely hot. 
obviously no air conditioning, the windows were open, the crowds were in the street, and the new courthouse, the reason it was at the city hall is the new courthouse, Atlanta's new courthouse was being built across the street. The attorneys. Um, Luther Z. Roster, Rosser and Reuben Arnold were the defense attorneys, extremely well-respected criminal attorneys. Um, the firm of, um, of Herbert Haas was actually the National, Company, National Pencil Company's legal. Um, um, it was the attorneys for the National Pencil Company, but they decided to go with non-Jewish attorneys and also with criminal attorneys. Hugh Dorsey was the prosecutor, Hugh Manson Dorsey, and he had lost a number of high-profile cases up to this point in time, and this case was very, very important for him to win. And it, he was counting on it to propel him further in his political career. Every day there was another headline, but the entire case, the entire prosecution's case, rested on the testimony of Jim Conley. Jim Conley is the key to the entire. He says that he helped Leo Frank dispose of the body, that he had nothing to do with her murder, and that um, the and, and the and the defense's whole case rested on trying to break him on the witness stand. So as you can see in this headline, Conley Grilled Five Hours by Luther Rosser. And in this next headline, you can see Conley's sto main story still remains unshaken. The reason this photograph is here is that's William Smith, and that is Conley's own personal attorney, the one who helps Conley develop his, you know, work on his testimony. He gets Conley ready for trial. He buys him a new suit of clothes. He, he's Conley's own attorney. And it's at this point, um, August 8th, that the defense makes a, a what today most attorneys think is a, is a pretty big mistake. They call for character witnesses to support the fact that Leo Frank was an honorable, honorable guy. And, and they do, they call his mother, they call friends, they call someone from Cornell University, but it allows the prosecution to then call witnesses to say that Leo Frank was not such a nice guy. And so what happens is the, the def prosecution calls, um, oh, here's one of the defense witnesses, this is his mother when she goes on the stand. And then what happens here on August 21st is all of these witnesses these are women who worked at the pencil factory are called in to testify that Leo Frank also looked at them oddly one day or stuck his head into the dressing room when they were trying to get ready for work. But you have to remember that this is 1913 and the mores of the Deep South were different from those of a Cornell educated man up north. When he sticks his head in the dressing room, it's just that they're taking off their jackets. And he's telling them to, you know, come on, hurry up, get to work. But for these young women working in this pencil factory, that was unacceptable. So we have two different lifestyles converging and two different understandings of what is proper and right happening in this case. And finally, Frank goes on the witness stand. He's not questioned. He gives a statement, which is what um, you were allowed to do at that point in time. And um, this becomes his famous statement, I've told the whole truth, nothing but the whole truth. And the whole thing is here. And he's on the stand for several hours. But it does not take the jury very long, the all-male, all-white jury, um, to convict him. And that's the headline from the conviction. So Jim Conley gets put in jail on a misdemeanor charge for aiding and abetting Frank and the disposal of the uh, body, and Frank gets sentenced to death. So now we move into the appeals phase of this fiasco. Um, this perfect storm, as, as, one of his, as, as one of Leo Frank's descendants described it. Um, I already mentioned the temple on Peachtree Street. It's the oldest. Um, Synagogue in Atlanta was established in 1867, but in 1913 it was on Pryor and Richardson Street, and this is the building 
that where it was. And this was the rabbi, Rabbi David Marks. Um, he liked to be called Dr. David Marks. And he visited Leo Frank every single day in jail. And he decides that nothing is going to happen if they don't get more national support for Leo Frank. Again, in retrospect, it is probably one of the biggest mistakes that the rabbi and his supporters could have done. We are only 50 years away from the Civil War, a war that has fought for states' rights. They didn't want the North ever telling them what to do. And they, the, the people in Atlanta felt strongly that they had given Leo Frank a fair trial. He was found guilty. What are you interfering with what, what's going on here? But needless to say, they do go up to New York to try to drum up national support to get Leo Frank a new trial. And they go to the publisher of the New York Times, Adolf Ox. Adolf Ox is himself Jewish, but he has never editorialized for a Jewish cause, ever, because he didn't want the New York Times to be seen as a Jewish newspaper. He wanted it to be seen as a great, uh, unbiased newspaper. And at first, he tells the delegation from Atlanta, no, I'm not going to help. But then he starts to do a little bit of his own research, and he really feels that there's been a miscarriage of justice. In his mind, it's Jim Conley, not Leo Frank, who's guilty of the crime, and he decides to help. So beginning on February 26, 1914, there is not one day until Leo Frank is lynched that there is not some sort of mention, editorial, or article about the Frank case in the New York Times. And although it does truly drum up support nationally, it does little to help Frank here in Georgia, in Atlanta. Um, these are some of the uh, appeals that were, were given. They were all denied. Um, this one related to a juror who um, said he felt Frank was guilty even before they were, went out of the jury room. Um, and this is when Reuben Arnold finishes one of his uh, appeals for Frank during one of his uh, statements for Frank during one of the appeals. But all of them are denied. And, and here's the first New York Times that uh, mentions the Frank case on February 26, 1914. With more insights and documents, the presentation by scholar Sandy Berman on the notorious Leo Frank case will continue in an upcoming episode of Jews in the South. <laughs>